Hey everybody, welcome to Cultivating Conversations on Cultivate with Kate. I get the honor and privilege of interviewing my dear friend, Flora Ekpe Idang, who is the founder and CEO of Courage Dolls, a multicultural doll and book company that helps to elevate, educate, and encourage girls of color to be unstoppable. So please join me in this conversation. All right, everybody, please help me give a warm welcome to my dear friend, Flora Ekpe Idang. Hello, hello, world. Hello, Kate. Hello. How are you, my friend? I am good. It is a nice, chilly, cold day here in Jersey, but hey, thriving, surviving, and, you know, enjoying the weekend as we have it. Um, How are you doing? So good to see you. Great to see you. I'm doing well. And, you know, I just want to acknowledge. So right now, audience, we're recording on Saturday, February 13th. And of course, we'll be posting this soon. But um, I just want to acknowledge it is Galentine's Day. So happy Galentine's Day. Additionally, I just learned, thanks to you, um, happy Black Love Day. Yes. Yes. Celebrate the love. Celebrate the melanin. (laughs) celebrate the melanin yes yes so thank you for coming on my show you are my second guest on cultivate with kate cultivating conversation series and you know just to to give the audience an understanding of how we met and how you know how we're connected i just want to let you know something amazing about flora First of all, we know that she is a a fierce black owned business woman, and she is just making a difference in our world, y'all. So first of all, that's why she's amazing. But (laughs) secondly, we went to college. We went to Pepperdine together. AO Waves, shout out out to, yes, go Waves, go Waves. (laughs) And so um, I remember the first time I met Flora was during new student orientation. So we call it NSO. And Flora, as part of the tradition, and I meant to tell you this the other night when we talked, um, my favorite memory, first slash first impression of Flora is that um, uh, there's there's this NSO tradition called Frosh Follies. And I remember Flora playing um, in a skit for her for her uh, residence hall. Mm -hmm. And she was playing like this fierce, you know, TV interviewer. Um, kind of like an Oprah Winfrey. Yep, and, you know, it was like a cool skit. And did you guys win? Did you guys win that year? Did we win? I I don't remember. I felt like we did, but I would have to go back into the archives and see. I felt like we performed good enough. Oh, you we perform- Because as well, I remember you performing and you were really good with your haul. And I remember Ashley Perez. Oh, the other Ashley God. Perez and her performing in her. Uh, and I was like, Okay, these are the folks that like I need to make sure I get to because like they're all phenomenal and like clearly yeah. I remember distinctly that. Oh, it was so much fun. And then afterwards, I, I know that um it was Mai Tai. It was a Mai Tai event. So for, for listeners who are not familiar with the Pepperdine tradition, so um there's a tradition called Mai Tai where uh you know we we um it, it's kind of a traditional, let's let's preface mm-hmm. it by that. It's the yeah. traditional right now for 2021. But it was fun, you know, when when it happened. Um uh it's like basically you go on like a a date basically right. that what it is? it's like yeah. you get paired with uh, somebody else and you go on a date with them in a, in a way but it's kind of a get to know you this is kind of pre yeah. e-heart, pre like going on tinder pre bumble pre everything it's bumble. like <laughs> it's mainly just to get to know somebody else at you know at pepperdine but like right. it's kind of like yeah a, and, and <laughs> right, it, it is kind of old fashioned, but you know, I celebrated the moment at the time. Yeah. But, but basically, the the guys' dorms they would um, put their neckties or accessories in a box, and then the the girls would then have to randomly select a tie, and then you know whoever the tie belongs to, that's your date for the night. And so then we're all taken up to uh, the our university president's house. It was just called the Brock House, and um, you know our president. At the 
the time represent um, Andrew K. Benton, AKB, um, who was our president at the time. Uh, you know, he's a great guitarist and he had his band. I think his band was called the Midlife Crisis. And um, <laughs> I remember, Flora, this is what I remember about you. You were dancing the night away. And I was like, yes, this girl knows she has great dance moves. She is so fierce. Like, I'm just like, I want to be her friend. So that's what I wanted to share with you the other oh, night. Oh, my so. gosh. Thank you, Kate. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Like, I, I remember meeting you as well during new student orientation and just, like, get, sensing your energy and vibe. I remember you distinctly at Frost Follies <laughs> doing oh. this. In your, and I was just like, okay, this female clearly has energy. And when clearly, <laughs> she walks into a room or clearly walks into our stadium at for our basketball game, like, she clearly... <laughs> you know, commands attention and this spirit and vibe that you had in the aura that you had instantly, I was just like, I, I need to get to know her. And ever since then, and when we, when we officially had time to get to know each other, like it's been amazing. Oh, and so, yeah. I'm so thankful for you. Well, and, thank you again for coming on my show and, and for taking the time out of your busy schedule, I'm sure. But we're going to learn more about Flora and her journey to creating what will be an empire, I believe, and I know it, um, yeah. with Courage Dolls. Speaking into existence. Say what? Speaking into existence. That's right. Manifest. Manifest. That's what we're here for, my friend. Yeah. So um, this is the uh, question that I traditionally want to continue asking all my guests who come on my show. And that is, what is your origin story? And then to tie it with my imagery of the theme of cultivation and cultivating um, together in our personal and professional growth, um, what are your roots? And roots can be things like your identity, your upbringing, um, you know, anything that you consider to be your foundation and your root. So Flora, tell us, what is your story? Yeah, um, so I am a Jersey girl, born and bred. Um, from New Jersey. I am a uh, first generation American. Yes. Um, yes. Um, give it up for the immigrant parents coming That's out right. here, making a name for themselves. Hey, immigrants, um, we get the job done. Yes, yes exactly. Yes. I'm, you know, I am a daughter of a father from Nigeria and a mother from Grenada, have an older brother. Um, I very much like the idea of identity and origin is so, so important to me. Like diversity and inclusion has always been something that's so important to me in our household growing up. Like, interestingly enough, it's like, you know, I'm a Christian, but my parents and my father had multiple books in our household. That was, a, you know, the Quran or the Torah mm -hmm. or, you know, uh, just, just so many different books just to be able to be aware and learn of um, this idea of, you know, just exposure to different religions, but most importantly, learning about different things in culture and identity. And um, I'm very much someone who, you know, I uh, went to, I went to probably the smallest high school. I was trying to tell people like, my high school experience is probably like the first inclination of what actually got me connected to me doing my business and oh. kind of got me on this journey to Karaja. I like to kind of go in that area and space because I went to a high school that was run by a Quaker. Wait. And Whoa. <laughs> okay. That was run by a Quaker who wore Pumas, really awesome woman named Sue uh, uh, Newellen. She's, you know, Sue Newman, sorry. Um, I'm probably messing up her last name. I apologize. Um, um, but like truly amazing. And my school had my graduating class in high school had 25, 26 people. Oh, wow. Like, that is I small. went to a very small school. And one of the key things about my experience there that really just started to expose me to the space of like, why do I genuinely want to care about empowerment of girls of color and that type mm -hmm. of space? So when I was in high school, we had an opportunity um, to read the vagina monologues. Mm -hmm. And that's not something you typically reading in high school <laughs> as a student. Oh. Um, and I had the opportunity to work with an amazing group of other females, diverse backgrounds, everything. And our teacher encouraged us to kind of write our own kind of perspective and lens on that story. And we actually decided to um, create our own monologues and wow. our own version of it. And we called it Echoes of Eve. Um, because the creator of Vagina Monologues was Eve Ensler. Okay. And, I was thinking uh, of Eve as in like Adam and Eve. And that was, it was a dual meeting. It was a, was a dual so meeting. It was wow. a dual, 
it was dual meaning. We like and, that duality, that dual yes, meaning. Yes. Yes. And I kind of wrote about just that idea of being like, you know, a plus size black female, talking about my hips, talking about identity, like trying to navigate that in high school. Mm-hmm. And other females wrote things about like, oh, amazing things about whether it had been about domestic violence or things mm-hmm. around um, bulimia or things around, you know, being someone who is Muslim. And mm-hmm. navigating go, navigating high school, wearing a uh, hijab, and also trying to you know make sure you represent your full self while seeing how maybe the world perceives of you, and many other narratives. And we actually had the opportunity to um, perform that play at the United Nations in New York. <laughs> I, I, never tell, I never, I don't tell many people that story, but like because my one of my neighbors, she passed away, with phenomenal. She was one of my mentors, Dr. Mm-hmm. Carolyn Williams, who actually was an NGO and worked at the United Nations and um, and was you know did work there in New York. And she told me she saw the play and was just like, "You guys, like we have this you know um, girls summit event that we do every year. We're bringing together females from all over the world, mm-hmm. and they're speaking on issues that's like whether it be human trafficking, whether it be issues of teen pregnancy, whether it be a spectrum. And we want you to perform. Want you guys to perform at this. And we're like, we're a bunch of high school kids. <laughs> but it was honestly in that moment when we had the opportunity to go." and perform and actually meet and we were you know we spoke in English and a lot of people who watched the performances were people coming from other countries who didn't necessarily speak English or they had a translator but I remember after we performed a woman came up to me I forgot from what African country she came from and um, her translator kind of spoke to me but she was saying that you know I didn't necessarily fully like know all the words of what you were saying but I knew what you were conveying and oh I, I loved it and I felt represented and seen. And I was just oh. like, it was, it was in that moment that was just like, the world is so much bigger than, and the issues are things that even I myself question about my identity or who, how I look or who I am navigating school and being, you know, trying to be proud of my, you know, my body and look um, mm-hmm. while still discovering everything. It was just so much about being in this space of other black women and other women of color, not just black women, should I say, mm-hmm. of all different ethnicities and races who were there to really focus on empowering yeah. young, young girls around the world. And that just always, always stood with me mm-hmm. and was this idea of like, okay, I care so deeply and like, you know, about empowering other young females mm-hmm. and being empowered myself. All my amazing, all the amazing mentors I've ever had were always women. Um, and that was just something that was so core to my identity and like why the things that I've done in my life, whether it be through mentoring, whether it be through creating garage dolls, whether it be through this notion of wanting to be able to know that especially girls of color, especially especially girls mm-hmm. could be unstoppable and that we deserved every opportunity and even opportunities that we may not even know exist yet, mm. but that we have a right to be in that. So yes. um, that was just something that, you know, I... Yeah, that was just something that like has always just been core and central to kind of my origin and story and like everything that continues to happen as it relates to why I'm I'm very focused in that space. Oh, that's phenomenal. I'm speechless right now because, wow, like what a beautiful testimony about your journey. And I I find it to be... um, Well, I find multiple themes of what you just shared. Mm -hmm. First of all, the theme of mentorship and the theme of, um, you know, having connection with someone who's older, perhaps maybe not older, but someone who um, partners with you and is willing to journey with you along your your path to whatever it may be. Right. And so um, when you mentioned that you guys did, let me rephrase, I should not use the word you guys as much that you all, or the Texan in me just want to say y'all. That is very, <laughs> just say, just that say is an inclusive y'all. language. Say, say how you would say. <laughs> it, it is, it is an inclusive language. Yeah. For y'all, you know, how, how y'all are, um, empowered to, to yeah. like, you know, read the vagina monologue. Like, first of all, I've never heard of that until when I was 
after college, I think, yeah. you know, cause I grew up, um, in Texas, shout out to Texas, uh, specifically the Dallas Fort Worth Metroplex and mm-hmm. it's, it's more conservative. And so, um, you know, we would not have things like that. Yeah. <laughs> and so yeah. that is so cool that your school had that opportunity and the opportunity to go to the UN. Yes. Wow, Flora. Wow. Yes. Like, I, I honestly, for not until you asked me about my origin story, because like, I was like, oh, like, let me think about when was like a time that really was like, connect me on this path. Like, remember in Pepperdine, when we had to fill out our application and we were asked, what's our voc- vocation? Like, I yes. remember oh that. Goodness. And I didn't know truly what that word meant at the time. Yeah. I just thought it was the same thing as like, oh, what are you passionate about? But then, I, you know, learning years later, just that notion of like, your vocation is like, what do you feel innately that mm-hmm. maybe you're either meant to do? Not something that either is focused on making you money or necessarily make, but like, what exactly are you trying to leave behind in this yeah. world that um, versus trying to receive? And, yeah. um, it, you know, like it took, I didn't, I don't remember what my answer was at that time. Cause I didn't know what that word really meant, but I got into Pepperdine. Thank you. <laughs> like I, I proved myself otherwise, but um it, I look back at that now and I really just think that like, honestly, the things that I, I, I do and I love, like, I feel like genuinely my vocation is in the empowerment mm-hmm. of girls of color, especially because I was just truly inspired and supported by so many amazing women, whether it be my mom, whether it be Dr. Carolyn Williams, whether it be my teachers in high school, whether it be, you know, you know, women that I met in my career who I was pretty like keeping it real with me and pushing me and also sharing the struggles of like how to like to be your unapologetic self. Um, yes. and, but no, like the barriers that exist, but still going forward. Yeah. In that. And so, um, I, I think that like, is just something that no matter what I do, uh, whether it's the doll company, whether it's, I'm working, it's something that like, is just in me that like continue okay. always to push and strive for so cool, Flora. So cool. Well, thank you for sharing that part about um, just the empowerment and, and all the wonderful things from your childhood and your high school, basically your formative years. That's, yeah. Cr- those are crucial years. And so, yeah, yeah, I think, yeah, I think that like sometimes we may not always have a time frame to like pause and think about like, what was it when we were younger that maybe like interested us in something years later? Because I think that um, it was a, it was also in high school, just for people who may not know, it was also in high school is when the notion of garage dolls, before it was garage dolls, just when this notion really came to mind of like wanting to see toy representation on shelves. Mm-hmm. And um, a lot of things happened in my high school years. <laughs> like I have, to give, I have to give it up to my high school, the Hudson School in Hoboken, New Jersey. Amazing school that taught me like so, like, Oh my goodness. I think it's one of the greatest high schools in existence because that school like allowed us to just truly like come into our own. We had teachers that were literally like activists, people who were, (sighs) who participated with MLK and like, it was very, it was just like, I look back at it now. I was like, I got to have that experience. Like, (sighs) Oh my goodness. That school was it's tr- it was transformative. You don't sometimes remember until you pause and you're like, man, some of those amazing things that happened when you were younger that helped, you don't realize it then, but now you look back and you're like, man, having that experience um, either helped put you in a certain direction or steered you from a certain direction. Right. Um, but yeah, sorry, I'm going off a tangent. No, so. don't apologize. We're here yeah. to experience <laughs> the story. Goodness, yes. I just uh, thank you, thank you, thank you. I do want to pivot a little bit and 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 touch now on your college years, right? So yes. we touched a little bit on the fun aspect of how you and I met, but yes. um, talk about your journey that eventually leads you to Courage Dolls. Yeah, um, let's yes. start with college and 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 your transition from Jersey from your phenomenal high school to now Pepperdine in Malibu, California. What was that journey <laughs> like for you? Oh gosh, the journey of <laughs> you know transitioning to I, I'm from East Orange, New Jersey, predominantly black area, urban city living, and um, going to Pepperdine, where the moment I stepped on a campus and I was like, this is the most beautiful 
school in the world. I have never seen a school that had a picturesque blue ocean view, blue skies. You every time at Pepperdine, we always said hashtag blessed because like I know, right? <laughs> you know, like you literally were like, oh my goodness, I'm I'm blessed to be here. Oh yeah. Uh, but it was it was at times intimidating, like mm-hmm. coming from the background that I had. You know, I that was the first time I'd ever seen students my age, people my age driving Maseratis. Like Yo. I saw an Aston Martin before. Right? And I was like I it, saw it, a Rolls Royce like one time, you know, um in uh the parking lot right by the health center. Yes. Like what? <laughs> right. And yeah. it was something that was just so like I felt like I had imposter syndrome. I know we've had that conversation before. Like that was like really when I felt that way because I was like, what am I doing here? Like, I don't necessarily belong. I don't have the money like these other students have. I I know what I care about. I know that I want to learn here and take advantage mm-hmm. of everything I can here. Yeah. But um, it was kind of that experience of being at Pepperdine, um, mm-hmm. which really stretched me mm-hmm. in the sense of like being really out of my comfort zone. I had never traveled that mm-hmm. far away. Well, granted, take that back. I went to like, you know, I take that back. I've traveled before, but I mean like moving away from home. Sorry, should I say? Right. And um, knowing that being in California, it was, you know, a school that I wanted to go to for quite some time. Mm-hmm. And, but when I got there, I was like, okay, I am really out of my limit. I don't see many people that look like me. I'm really nervous how to navigate this space. I don't have the flashy money um, mm-hmm. <laughs> to, you know, right. keep up with maybe some of the standards not standards but maybe how some people um live and And it's just a quick disclaimer so we're not trying to diss pepperdine by any means oh no no, there is an aspect of of wealth at that school you know of certain students and families like like flora myself i am a combination of grants and scholarships and a little bit of student loans that was the journey that i took to um, enter Pepperdine and and be able to sustain, but yes, continue your your story. Absolutely, right? and everything Pepperdine offered me was phenomenal. Yeah, and um, it was when I actually had an opportunity to study abroad that getting that yes. you know exposure to not just like domestic diversity, but also this international diversity. And this is what also sparked me in the space of being interested in like multicultural marketing, right. other spaces, being more exposed to other cultures and identities. And I had the pleasure of studying abroad um, in Shanghai, China. Our class, our group was the first one to go to Shanghai literally a month or so after the Beijing Olympics. Oh, and so literally fun. right before Obama got elected for the first time, it was right in between of that era. And it was the most phenomenal like time frame of my like another pivotal moment yeah. in my life that was very much rooted in like, okay, once again, I'm in a culture I'm not as familiar with, but I'm going to push myself to learn the language, get to know the culture, mm-hmm. um, explore, you know, the city, explore other countries. And I was very much just like, just, just, you know, amazed by um, seeing, you know, in th- the way that either, marketing was done or eating food or hopping on <laughs> trains yeah. and planes, and everything mode or transportation, but also just like being in an area of Shanghai that was really about the past and where we lived in the Fuxi side and also the Pudong side, which was the new modern side. And yeah. what that looked like for a city that was transitioning into this like new version of itself while also still honoring the the past of what it was. And yeah, it, yeah I loved it. Oh, so good. So I see a theme also here. You mentioned, you know, like yeah. your interest in 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 uh, multicultural and, and representation, and yes. then the the foundation of courage. And so let's yeah. talk about the genesis of it. Yes. Yes. Let's talk first about all, courage. Yes. Yes. First of all, why the name courage? Oh, that's a great question. So um, just to give people context, like um, when I was in high school, another moment in high school, what's kind of was the, you know, the moment that sparked Garage Doll was I was in, I was in class in junior, um, my junior year watching a documentary called Girl Like Me. Mm -hmm. And it was in health class. And the documentary was to study the impact of colorism Mm -hmm. on young children of color. 
and the fact of a lack of media representation, things of that nature. So there was this test that was done in that documentary called the Doll Test. And it was initially done in the 1940s by these two, um, I believe, psychologists. Mm -hmm. And initially done to study the impact of segregation on young children of color during the time of the board versus education case, mm -hmm. which was this basically determine should schools still be into should schools sorry still be segregated or should it be integrated mm -hmm. and this test was done where it took a group of black children and white children and they were given a black doll and a white doll asked mm -hmm. various questions such as which doll is prettier smarter so on and so forth mm -hmm. the children overwhelmingly chose the white doll when it came to anything positive and the black doll <laughs> when it came to anything negative mm -hmm. and when the children were asked which doll do you associate most with they said the black doll the black children mm -hmm. said the black doll mm -hmm. and that was just, you know, just giving you everyone the context. That was done in the 1940s initially. It's been done plus years over years. So when I watched this documentary when I was in high school, this was clearly redone again. Yeah. And it had similar results. And it was just in that moment that it was so disheartening mm -hmm. and so disappointing, but also just like, wow, these kids are like five or so years old, mm -hmm. already having in their mind that they are not either good enough or mm. that what they see is what they like, that they internalize. So it's in essence, like internalized racism. Mm -hmm. And um, that was just something that truly stuck with me and um, stood with me. And I didn't know at that moment, like, what did I want to do with that? I didn't know what Karaj was. Da, da, da. But basically I, you know, took years of just keeping that in the back of my mind as I thought about, man, toys were something that was that helps build a child's imagination. It's one of the first items a kid gets when they're building their mindset and their imagination and being able to, you know, discover play and, you know, build out who they can be. Right. And um, years later when I was getting, when I was starting the process, it wasn't until 10 plus years later when I went to grad school that I decided that, man, after all these years of still not seeing much diversity on toy shelves, demographics have shifted. Mm -hmm. I'm still seeing this idea that there's a lack of much representation on shelves. And if there is, it's pretty homogenous. Yep. And so um, it was when I went to grad school that I said, okay, I want to actually work on creating a solution here. One day I was writing a business canvas for a class assignment and you had to write down, what do you want your company to stand for? Like, what do you want what you're doing to represent or mean? And I was writing down, like, I want, you know, girls to be bold. I want them to be fierce. I want them to be kick-ass. I want yes. them to have courage. And yes. I want them to be unstoppable. And the word courage just kept coming up. And so I went on dictionary.com and looked up the origin of the word and it's courage without the U. And it also oh. works perfectly in French, Spanish, and Latin. Um, okay, Latin roots, romantic languages. <laughs> Shout out. Shout out. I, you know, future thinking there. And I just decided, like, I will call it, you know, I call the cur I initially said courage, and then I decided to just say courage uh, to get a little flair. And that was kind of the the beginning of why I chose and why I wanted that phrase and name to represent ultimately what I wanted girls and boys to, um, to feel. Yeah. Wonderful. You mentioned grad graduate school. Can you tell us more? Where did you go to grad school? Yeah. What did you study? And, and tell us yes, everything. Yes. Yes. Journey. I know. So I know I'm kind of like going through elements of my journey, but, um, you know, after, uh, like Pepperdine, cause I was, when I was at Pepperdine, I studied advertising and marketing. So I, by the way, for people who are either currently in college or trying to figure things out, I changed my major like three times, by the way. And so I definitely had to do a lot of, uh, summer school. It's okay. It's okay. Yeah, it happens. It happens y'all. It happens. It happens. <laughs> um, but ultimately well, after I graduated college, I worked in advertising, especially multicultural marketing and multicultural advertising. But over a couple of years later, after after I stayed living in LA, I was like, you know what? I'm very interested in going to grad school because I want to, I, it was always just staying with me that I want to further pursue this idea that just was not going away 10 plus years later. Mm -hmm. um, I had the opportunity when I was at Pepperdine to inter intern at a toy company, but I still was interested. Like, I want to be able to do this. So I said, I want to go to, why not go to the number one school in the country for entrepreneurship? which is Babson College. And Babson College in Wellesley, Massachusetts, um, I, you know, had uh, interviewed there and connected there. They actually had, they actually have this really awesome incubator program focused on women entrepreneurs oh, called amazing. the Win Lab, Women Innovating Now. And we have a whole center 
um, called Sewell Center for Women Entrepreneurial Leadership. And I was like, I want to be a part of this. I want to be like, I want access to all of this. And I want to be in a space where like, you know, I'm trying to figure out this whole space of entrepreneurship. I knew I had the creative background, but I didn't feel necessarily maybe I had more of the business acumen side of like, okay, how do I go into the space of toys, like supply chain? Let me understand finance forecasting. How do I actually, you know, de develop the product, position the brand, da, 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 all these things. And I just connected with Babson. And so when I got in and decided to move from California to Massachusetts and come back to the East Coast, um, Honestly, for people, if you've ever been to Babson, for the people who know Babson, da, 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 like I swear Shark Tank must have gotten its whole concept from Babson because the second you go there, you feel like you are pitching your business oh, all the time. Sure. Like if anything, I learned definitely how to work on pitching and still something I'm working through. But one of the first things we got to do in one of the classes you take is Entrepreneurial Thought in Action, ETA. That's kind of a, a, a framework that the school kind of developed. And there's a class focused on that. And there's an opportunity for you to pitch a business idea that you have. You have three minutes and three slides. Oh, wow. And you have to, only three you have minutes, everyone. only three slides. Wow. Continue. Three minutes <laughs> and three slides. I'm telling you, Shark Tank doesn't have anything on no. that. <laughs> I'm like, good. And this is when you're like, you're, you're not, you're a couple weeks into the program. And, wow. um, I, everyone has to present mm -hmm. Ev even, if, even if it's a real idea, not a real idea. Da, da, da. And this was the first time that I was officially going to present like, cause I had worked on my business canvas not too long before that was still sure. like figuring out a lot of things. And I was like, okay, I'm in a classroom full of people who are very much business types come from consulting, da, da, da. No one's gonna re resonate with a toy company. Like no one, I you know, for me, I probably naively thought that like, okay, this is a toy company focused on young females of color and empowerment. Maybe this is not the space for that in a B MBA program. And um, I pitched it and presented it, and I practiced like crazy prior to that. And um, the students, all of our classmates, have to vote on the top uh, people who present, like in terms of like your pitch, what's your idea, what's the impact, what your ask is, da, da, da. And I was one of the winners of the, that was my first pitch competition, I guess, if you want to say that. And you want a baseball. It's like, a, <laughs> like you want a baseball as a way of that. And I was shocked. And I wouldn't say that moment was like, okay, this is like determined that like my idea is valid, da, da, da. but it was reassuring that mm -hmm. it was the first time I was really revealing in this type of setting, um, in my first couple weeks at the school that like, you know, here's the problem. Here's what doesn't exist. Here's why I'm trying to help solve it. This is what I'm trying to do uniquely in this space. Like there is this lack of representation, but most importantly, here's the lasting impact yeah. of what this does to kids wow. when they consistently do not see themselves. And I tried to paint the picture for my classmates of like, imagine you're going into a toy store and you're looking around and you realize that you can't find anything that looks like you. Mm. And what is that feeling? And what is that feeling of feeling like the other? Yeah. And so for people, regardless of ethnicity or race or gender, like going into a space and feeling like the other, but imagine having that happen multiple times and you, it sticks with you years later. And so that was what I was trying to get at um, with Garage Dolls. And yeah, that was kind of, the first time and the first pitch <laughs> that I did um, to kind of really work to bring that to life. And, and I just continued working on it from there. Wow. So then from Babson and from that moment where you had to do your yeah. three minute pitch with, you know, the three slides, um, talk me through balancing going to school and then starting yeah. this business and then eventually, I know you go into full time employment, like yes. balancing, doing all of that. Can you talk about that journey for us? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so when I was at Babson, I said, okay, I'm going to take these two years while I'm here and just really devote a lot of time. Um, what, it was, what was fortunate about the program is that because a lot of the classes were rooted in entrepreneurship type thinking, you, the professors allowed you to actually kind of work on your business idea for classes. So say like working on finance, okay, we're going to work on your financial forecasting for your business. 
Oh, or nice. we're going to work on this. And so it was a lot of us got to be able to leverage the companies we were either working on or trying to build or had already and got to work on those as assignments and just ultimately get our other classmates to help support us mm-hmm. um, and vice versa. And so, um, but my first year, especially at Babson, um, I didn't come from a place of knowing manufacturers. I did. I didn't know anyone who was a toy manufacturer because toy manufacturing, 99% of it is in Asia. And so it's not like I could make this doll in my kitchen. And so um, I very, like, you can't just, like, bake it in the oven and, like, and make it in the kitchen. Uh, oh, gosh, like, can you imagine? Oh, gosh. It's, unless it's a gingerbread cookie, I guess. Yes, so, yes. But, um, Yes. But anyways, um, so one of the things I did, I I don't draw really well. And so I, you know, spoke to classmates and I was actually, um, I went on a website while I was in school called 99 Designs. And I was like, okay, I want to start figuring out how can I get someone who's like an engineer to help me design what the doll can look like. I first started leveraging one of my classmates who was a drawer and I just gave her photos. And then I went on 99 designs and I put together a collage of 50 different faces of oh, wow. young black girl, 50 oh, different wow. faces, because I wanted the features to look truly authentic and mm-hmm. like a girl of today that I wasn't seeing on shelves. Yeah. And then I found this amazing designer who actually was able to create a CAD file a 3d model of her and i asked a classmate and i was just like i know you have a background in 3d printing can you help me 3d print so our school had 3d printers nice and uh, (laughs) and i would use um when i got the doll 3d printed i was like trying to maneuver the hair trying to figure out clothing and i had spent time during either during class or for assignments or when i was like being able to be in boston and just go and interview people So I spent time interviewing parents, interviewing kids, and just letting everyone know my first prototype honestly looks like a black Skeletor. So like the way Aaliyah looks now is very different from what she looked like (laughs) years ago. Progress. (laughs) Yeah, it progress. All about progress, not perfection. And I just like, you know, really like me working on my business plan was I was able to work on that while I was in school. So by the time I was a second year MBA student, I specifically chose classes that I could be able to like, okay, okay, I'm trying to figure out supply chain. Let me try to go in that class and see how I can figure out inventory for my own business or This is a business plan class. How can I leverage that? So on and so forth. Let me talk to my professors, get some advice here. Let me, I was always talking to my classmates who had different experiences and my amazing classmates that I had, um, just helping provide me with different um, advice and guidance. My second manufacturer that I actually got was because of one of my classmates. Oh, wow. Who had a connection in this space. And, um, it was kind of working simultaneously. Like I was in class trying to make sure I'm passing on my classes while, you know, in the evenings or being able to like, Hey, you guys are looking for a project, a business to work on. Can you help me? Um, I was not shy to be like, I need help. And, um, it ultimately, like I had the opportunity, my, the summer of my first year of grad school to intern at Hasbro. And it was amazing because I had the opportunity to work on, on transformers and that was the first time being able to kind of like learn the ins and outs of a, such a massive toy company. And what is the idea of creating a, an ecosystem mm-hmm. of a brand that continues to connect with generations after generation and yeah. they continue to create more products and everything of that nature. So I, I say all that because once I eventually graduated, I wasn't planning to go and work at a company. Um, I was planning to try to launch Garage Dolls, and I was like, okay, I'm ready for this. But then I landed an opportunity that arose um, with Target. And um, I, you know, I was upfront with the brand and like, hey, I'm working on a business. I'm trying to figure this out. Like, I don't know if I want to go work corporate. Yeah. Um, And were you about to say something? I was going to ask you, so this is, is this in the midst of you still in grad school that you landed an opportunity with Target or is this after you graduated? This was while I was still in grad school. Fantastic. Yes. <laughs> All these things are happening. Full-time job. While, literally, while like, so the opportunity, so my second year of my MBA program. So after my first year, spending a lot of time in my base, like my regular classes, trying to work on 
interviewing people. I probably interviewed more than a hundred plus people. I had my, my Babson was able to cover me going to the New York toy fair. And wow. so I was able to go as a student uh, more than one occasion and just like use that as a way to just learn. Like I was, I was very much very attuned to how can I leverage the resources that the school was providing me and being very specific about what I wanted. Mm. Um, and so, um, when Target came around, like I was actually at the National Black MBA Conference and I actually, you know, my, it was about my second year of my MBA program and mm-hmm. I wasn't looking for, it was just more so for connections. And there was a connection in, um, where I they just realized I had a multicultural marketing background mm-hmm. and an opportunity arose to do multicultural marketing at Target. And I didn't know that existed at companies. And like I said, for me, diversity and inclusion and this connection has always been something very important to me. And um, it just, you know, it was literally my when I was starting my second year of my MBA program that this opportunity arose and uh, a couple months in. And, you know, eventually I decided, okay, like if I do this, what is the impact to me start Mm -hmm. launching my business or what does this do here? But I can learn about the space of retail. I can learn more. Uh, and that lens. And so eventually, you know, I decided to take on the role and I'm still currently today at Target uh, focus on leading our black audience marketing strategy. So I get to focus 24-7 on connecting with the black audience. But um, it was very much a journey and definitely like that, ba- you know, balancing, trying to make sure, um, you know, doing everything for class, but also the benefit, the strong benefit of being able to leverage the resources. Because I was also able to join that women accelerator program I was telling you about yeah. while I was in my, like my second year of my in my program. How did you balance your time? I don't you know. I use the word balance, but then sometimes I hate using that word because I don't know if balance is the right word. But how did you handle? I guess is the better or manage your time, yes. not just your time, but your energy in the midst of all of these different opportunities that are going for you. What was that like for you? Balancing, I will say still, even to this day (laughs) is very much something that I work on. Um, I think versus when I was in school versus now, I think I try to like genuinely write down my goals and like, what do I need to get done for the day? When I was in school though, I was trying to work on a business, was in class full time. Um, I was also a, a graduate assistant. <laughs> I oh, also wow. was at one point leading leading our Black MBA Association while doing a conference we were launching for the first time. Okay, and Achiever, yes. <laughs> and so um, it was a lot, and and I was and I was involved in our student government, um, and so I I don't even know, Kate, and and I lived like. I would commute to school. I didn't even live on a campus. I would commute like 30 minutes to get to school each day. And I, I think maybe it was adrenaline. Maybe I, <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't drink Red Bull or anything. I don't take any pills or anything. And I don't know. I think sometimes the things I'm really excited about and have a passion for, like I only did things Mm -hmm. that I was genuinely really interested. But at the same time, I will not lie that like it can of course relate to burnout. And that was something that I had to, but my second year of grad school definitely was able to get a little better in that because I was able to very, be very meticulous about like, okay, I'm going to take these certain classes only if they, or if I'm able to actually work in my business Mm -hmm. and like get, you know, how does it help in this process? But for the most part, like I will say each day at a time, I it, it was not a perfect science. It was not like, hey, I did all this stuff and um, I did it 100% at the level of everything I wanted to do. Right. Absolutely no way, shape or form. Um, but as I've gotten older, so a little bit older, the idea of like, what can I, what do I prioritize and versus what some things just have to take a back step because either is it serving the goals that I'm trying to achieve or is it something that like I genuinely can put off um, at this time and pursue at a later moment. So. Wow. Yeah. How was your sleep during that time? Out of curiosity. My sleep. um, First year of my program, sleep sucked. (laughs) <laughs> like I think anybody, I, I'm so, I'm just, anybody I'm sure who's doing a, a graduate program or any post um, yep. graduate program, like the first year is like 
you know, I, I'm only speaking for MBAs. I can't speak for law school students. I don't, I can't speak for PhD people. I'm sure it's intense, but you're, you're trying to figure out like the program and classes yeah. and exams, and you're working a lot of group projects with a lot of people that you don't fully know and don't know their behaviors and attitudes and how they study and everything. Um, sleep my first year sucked. I bet. <laughs> uh, it sucked by second year. Like I said, second year was able to get a little better. Um, but I, for students, those who are in classes now or even pursuing a second degree in any way, like I having a planner, if I look back now, if I had a student planner, if I actually wrote down, like, these are the key goals I need to try to aim for today mm -hmm. between, you know, work, if I'm thinking about school, personal life, health and wellness in some way, if I did that, then I think I would have been a little bit more meticulous about what I wanted to make sure I prioritize and get done and what it was like, you know what, Flora, you got to put this off to a little bit later because if you don't get this done, then you won't, everything else goes to crap. Um, and so yeah, I'm not going to lie. Definitely the first year of my program, sleep wasn't too, too excellent. And definitely not something I recommend and making doing that. I recommend time management is one of the things that I continue to very much work on, but definitely in that program. Wow. 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 I, I, I feel like your story is very much relatable to so many people in the world, right? Mm -hmm. Like trying to juggle different things, different roles in life. Um, in your case, you were balancing school and then eventual transition to working full time while also trying to start this business, like a startup essentially. And so, um, wow, queen, like, thank you for <laughs> being vulnerable and being honest about that journey, because that is, yeah. I, I can't imagine. I mean, granted, I, on a, you know, did graduate school work as well. Um, yeah. My program was with Abilene Christian University. Shout out, go Wildcats. Um, and it's an online program. And I got my master's of science in organizational development. And I was doing that in the midst of working full time for Pepperdine. And mm -hmm. even that period of time, I just remember, like, even though it was one class at a time and each class uh, if I'm not mistaken, it's about six weeks long and even one class only like the struggle was real. <laughs> and yeah. so, you know, to balance full time and then school and then for, to add a business and a side hustle on top of that, phew, a lot, a lot, a lot to handle and we can do difficult things. And so just thank you for sharing that journey. Um, yeah. I want to now transition to asking about your first doll, Aaliyah. Yeah. So yeah. I have here with me, I don't know if you want to show your doll, but I'll show you my doll. Yeah. So here's Aaliyah. Hello. Yeah, everybody. Oh, she is beautiful, but not just beautiful. <laughs> she looks girl. Those and, show, and show the shoes that she originally had. Those are the, so those are the, the shoes, shoes. That are the original. Yes. And yes. these are ones that I'm like testing out right now. Is some yes. New idea. So, so for those who are listening and not seeing the video um, on and listening on the podcast. Um, so I'm holding the OG, the original Aaliyah outfit. Um, she has beautiful uh, purple shirt with beautiful flowers around, you know, different flower patterns and her shoes coordinate with her blouse or shirt and as well as her headband, and she is rocking this denim uh, bottom. Um, what are, these are these capri pants? Like, what are they called? I you know what? I guess so. Is that what? Yeah, I guess those are. Capri. I don't know if it's capri or, or um. I don't know. I don't, like, is it? There's another name for it, but either way, if um the audience, okay. if you know what the name of this type of uh pants are, you know, let us know. Um, but yeah. she is just so adorable. And what I love about the way she looks here is that I'm grateful, Flora, that no offense, actually a little offensive to, uh, not offensive. I don't know if I'm using the right word, but no offense to Barbie. Yeah. But if Barbie's offensive, I can't, or offended, then I can't help it. But um, <laughs> sorry, Mattel, you know, but like, 
I like that this doll looks like a girl, not um, a disproportionate um, sexual objectified figure. Does that make sense? So I really yeah. appreciate the innocence of this doll. Um, yeah. So first of all, why the name Aaliyah? Yeah. Um, so Aaliyah for, you know, for those who know, but you know, it, she was named after the great R and B singer. Um, so for the youngins who may not know, Aaliyah was a pivotal R and B singer of the nineties and early two thousands who unfortunately passed away. And I she always, Yes. Right. She literally was and always will be one in a million. Mm -hmm. And um, that, right. <laughs> I had to bring it back. I had to bring it oh back. Oh my goodness. Yes. You no, know, no. And um, the name had always stuck with me. And I was just like, you know, as I'm developing this first doll, like I want her to have that beautiful, amazing name. Cause I was growing up always having the Aaliyah poster in my room. And yeah. so felt like that, that's a strong, beautiful, queen, dumb type of name and felt that was what she deserved. Yes. And I love her hair. And yes, the hair. Talk, talk, to her, talk to us about her hair. Okay. Talk to the audience. Let's for those who are not watching, um, what does yeah. her hair look like? So for those who can't see right now, Aaliyah, you know, she has this soft, voluminous, coily, you know, Afro-esque, uh, of just beautiful bouncy curls hair. And this was something that I kid you not probably took the longest piece. Like just so people don't, people may not know it probably took, this was like two years in development truly of getting this doll to look and um, feel like this. So the Aaliyah doll is 14 inches tall. She is ball jointed at the arms and the legs. And like, she doesn't have a thigh gap. I was very particular about oh, making sure she, ha she had a body um, that was deserving. Yes. And you can flex her and bend her. And honestly, no one's ever told me she's broken. I've had like, no one's that's never happened. Oh. But the hair, when I was working with my manufacturer, I was very particular about the hair because when I had my black Skeletor version of Aaliyah <laughs> and was testing that out, I was talking to kids and families and I was trying to get a gauge of like, what was kind of the important features of the doll they really liked, da da da. And they were saying like, oh, I love the hair. Or I really want hair, da da da. And so when I met with my manufacturer, I had actually went through so many different rounds of different hair because I wanted her hair not to go straight down. Like it's just straight. I wanted her hair to go out mm. because you know, the more coily your hair is, the more your hair goes out versus down. And right. so I wanted that feature to be also inclusive, but it was a struggle at first to find the right type of hair um, that really had that type of amazing texture and, you know, wasn't a wig, but it's actually hair that's inside right. the, you know, planted in the actual head. So you don't have to worry about the hair coming off or anything of that nature. And um, every time I was starting to get a different round of the hair and the hair concept, I would just enter, you know, I would just send it to family and friends and their kids and just send them photos like, hey, what do you think of this hair type? What do you think of this hair? I was always just prototyping, iterating and asking questions. And then eventually when the manufacturer, I think they had to go a little bit out of their way to find this type of hair uh, just to get it the way that I felt you know, girls deserved to have it. Mm -hmm. um, we finally came to a good agreement. And when I saw Aaliyah and when I saw this, this amazing, you know, voluminous, coily curls that you could easily wash and style and everything, I was just like, this is the look. Yeah. So this took a while. This probably took the longest element of this entire doll was specifically trying to ensure that the hair was really authentic and meaningfully connected to who is representing. Gosh, she is beautiful. Aaliyah is gorgeous, y'all. She is gorgeous. Um, yes. I know that uh, Flora, you, you showed your doll and I know your doll has a different outfit on. Can you describe to the yes. audience the outfit and yes. uh, what you have right now? 
going for you. Yeah. So the doll that Kate is, you know, um, rocking is the one with the lead of her original outfit that she explained there. For me right now, I've been working on testing new accessories because, <laughs> you know, just to let, you know, give them a little inside, you know, Ooh. intel. We're working right now on coming out with new um, accessories for Aaliyah. So that is in the works coming soon. Um, but what she, Aaliyah is wearing is these really awesome sneakers, these huh. white kind of, Looks like Ked type. You know, no. I don't know if Ked would be the right one, but like maybe like Ked type of cool sneakers. Right. Wearing this really awesome skirt and this polka dot um, multicolored shirt um, that she's rocking. So this is kind of like the Aaliyah, you know, she's just rocking outside. Maybe she's going to the mall. Maybe she's going out on the street in um, Chicago or just, you know, hanging out with her friends. And this is just kind of that chill vibe look or okay. she's kind of heading to school. And so there's so much multidimensionality of Aaliyah, like um, for those who may not as well know, like I also created a children's book that teaches, um, you know, there you go right there. Don't give up Aaliyah. Yes. Um, the children's book that accompanies uh, the Aaliyah doll. And I really felt it was very impactful for people to give a sense of like, who is this character Aaliyah? Not just the doll that of course they can create their own version of what they want her identity to be, but wanted to give at least a starting ground of yeah. what I felt Aaliyah represented, who is an eight-year-old Chicago kind of, you know, old, spunky, old soul entrepreneur in the making. And she's she's like, very... She sounds like you. Is she inspired <laughs> by you, Flora? She sounds like you. She's inspired, she's inspired by me with a little bit of um, one of our friends that you also know, Ashley Watson. Oh, uh, Ashley. Also went, I actually nod to her in the book. Um, in terms of one of the people that I call out at the beginning uh, who was helped inspired. Because when I, Ashley was a friend of ours, still a friend, but she went to Pepperdine with us as well. And she was just kind of this old soul yes. kind of personality. I was like, why is beyond her years, even though she's only in her early 30s? Yeah. And I wanted Aaliyah to kind of have this blend of like my personality in terms of this like, okay, creative ideation. Like one thing about Aaliyah's character that she always carries around a green notebook. And for me, I always have a notebook in the nice. vicinity of like everything I do because I'm always thinking of ideas and thoughts. Wow. And Aaliyah carries around this green notebook everywhere because she's always just ideating and inspired by things she's mm -hmm. seeing in her community. And so the book's premise is basically like she, you know, sees an issue happening and she decides that she wants to kind of invent or develop a new solution to help her friends um, with a new product. But she kind of learns along this way that entrepreneurship and the creation of developing a product is not something you just do alone. It's like, how can you really, you know, partner with your friends, like the closest network? I think a lot of times entrepreneurship gets glamorized in a certain way that like you wrote your idea down on a napkin, you passed it on to a VC and bam, you get millions of dollars. <laughs> and <laughs> that's not and how it works. Down, right, right. It's just like that's how it works every day, right? <laughs> and so um Aaliyah kind of, you know, it's titled Really Don't Give Up Aaliyah to really teach kids about this idea of perseverance and determination mm -hmm. and but really being rooted in what are you trying to solve and what's your why? Mm. And uh, along the way, Aaliyah, you know, gets the help from her friends and her family. She has a younger brother who's six year old named Amari, who's a blurred. For those who don't know, that's a black nerd. Um, <laughs> <and they're laughs> <in the mom>. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, thank you. I've never heard of that terminology. So he was there. A you go, blurred, blurred community. I see you. You're represented. Wait, spell, spell that. So B B L E R D L E R D. Okay, like blurred an Urkel, United. but like more refined. Yes, it's like I don't know because it's like you know the Urkel of the day meets like you know Donald Glover, oh, aka Thomas Gambino, love. meets like I don't know, meets like fanatics of comic books, black fanatics, you know, there's a whole sub community yes. of those who are black that don't always get to be like shown like the comic con space or <laughs> those who love, you know, um, entertainment, comic books and, or anime. And so her brother is a six year old kind of whiz kid who's a blurred. And I was love. like, I gotta have a blurred representation in this. Um, is, this in but, relate, you know, is this related to your actual brother in real life out of curiosity or Oh, not? no, no. My brother, <laughs> my, well, my brother, my brother, I wouldn't consider him a blurred. He loves video games. Well, he does collect different toys, but I don't know if I consider, I don't know if I would say he legit is a blurred because I think people who are really blurred would be like, nah, your brother's not that blurred. Not blurred. I, my brother, if he's watching this, you're not a blurred, but you're <laughs> not a blurred. Um, 
but there's just so many amazing people that Ali is inspired by that you get to learn about in the book mm -hmm. um, who kind of encouraged her on her pathway as she just keeps in mind, like, how do I think about like trying to make change in my community? But I'm only this young kid in my community. But she learns that like, it's not something you have to feel like you have to do alone. And um, really having this close connection of people around you as you're trying to work on creating a solution that, um, and just the lens of, I was just inspired by all these little young girls today who were building businesses or being activists, you know, finding, I don't know, new chemist inventions. It's, it's amazing what this younger generation, uh, maybe through the, because of technology and maybe it's because of just the willpower and what they've had to navigate in terms of being resilient in this day and age that I wanted the story and book to be through the lens of another young girl, just like going out there and doing that. So then other kids can be like, okay, I don't have to be 20 something or th I, I can start this now yeah. and know that I can make some type of change, but, but also making sure that parents or the family members who are there, who can support that and also just help um, encourage them, but also, you know, keep, you know, it's sort of like, okay, let's make sure you're doing, you know, keeping this in mind. But I think you really get to see this awesome unit of who Aaliyah's family is um, mm -hmm. while how Aaliyah is ultimately just trying to, um, trying to make just, just everyday change. Nothing dramatic, but just what can each one of us do? Yes, yeah. yes. As, um, you know, I, I, I'm a fan of Michael Jackson and um, specifically his music. Granted, not the accusatory parts, but um, mm -hmm. I, I think of, you know, songs like um, uh, Man in the Mirror and yes. we'll Make That Change, you know. Um, yes. I think it's Man in the Mirror, right? Right When he's yeah. whispers yeah. at the end, like, make, make the change. change. Yeah, the change starts... Uh, if you wanna, if you wanna be a something, if you wanna make, wait, if you wanna make the world a better place, take a look at yourself and make that change. There you go. Yes. Na 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 na. I know. People in the comment section, miss the rest of the song. Yeah. That could be a challenge. Oh my god. Finish what we thought. I just. But but seriously, like I'm so glad that you wrote a book about resiliency, even though the word resilience isn't on here, but the notion of not giving up, the notion of, you know, always um doing something and making action based on your ideas. And I remember going to one of your, uh, so, so for the audience, I, I had the pleasure and privilege of listening to Flora in a forum recently with Pepperdine University's Seaver alumni program. Shout out to our friend, Hannah Dean for being a phenomenal yeah. moderator in that. Um, but I remember you saying progress, not perfection. And I know you said this earlier in our, in our conversation, but can you talk more about this idea and, and your advice to people about taking action versus perfectionism. Can you flesh that out for us? Yeah, absolutely. I think, um, honestly, it's a cheesy phrase, but no time better than a present. Mm -hmm. um, yes. Uh, no time better than a present to cult cultivate courage, cultivate the action, what you call the conversation, cultivate you know, um, action in, in many ways that I think one thing I've realized through this journey is that like, if I didn't even first pitch the idea of Courage Dolls when I was so nervous in a space that like, okay, if I can, can I even bring it up in an area where people probably, I, I had this assumption, people wouldn't get it. They wouldn't understand it. I'm in a business school. I'm not coming here trying to do a certain thing. So I'm already psyching myself out. Majority of the time, it was me psyching myself out mm. versus if I would have said and would have took the chance, it wasn't as always, it wasn't as bad. It was yeah. typically like, you know, it was always a lesson learned. And I think a lot of times, and I still do this today, like at times of like psyching myself is that fear of like, here's 10,000 ways this could potentially go wrong versus mm -hmm. like, there's probably an abundance of ways of how this can go right. Mm -hmm. And even if it doesn't, um, being able to learn from that experience and just be like, okay, you know, this didn't work out that great that time, but I'm going to try again in another moment. And then I'm going to try again in another moment. And I think for those of us and still today, myself, um, this idea of not everybody 
is going to vibe with what you're throwing down. Not everybody is going to vibe, but there is going to be some, there's going to be an abundance of people who are watching you and the shadows or listening to you who are just like, I see what you did. And I appreciate that because either mm-hmm. I felt seen or it encouraged me to do something. I know we've had this conversation. It's like, you know, and for myself, I'm like, I, I, you know, I was doing it because I was like, I just need to put it out there because I know that it can't stay in my head forever. And I, I want to work on this. Um, and you'll be surprised the number of times that um, I just took that chance. And I was like, very surprising versus maybe what I thought in my head, mm-hmm. what could go wrong versus like, actually what could go right. Mm-hmm. Um, wow. And yes. yes. And I think that's something that, um, yeah. I have a sign in my bedroom, in my apartment um, from this um, great home decor company called Rayo and Honey, amazing brand. And it says rise despite fear. And I have that in my bedroom. Literally every morning I wake up um, and I look at that. I had it purposely positioned where when I wake up in my bedroom, that's the first, one of the first things I see. Um, And it's just something that's like, okay, I'm, you know, I'm going to want today. I'm going to try to show up as my unapologetic self. I'm going to mess up what I'm saying here. I'm probably going to test this out. And, and it's every little step. I think sometimes we think we have to take a massive leap Mm -hmm. in terms of like, you just creating this podcast right now. Like we were talking earlier about the type of equipment or things of that nature. We're like, actually, let's start off simple. Let's like, just putting the recorder on. Yep. And just reaching out to myself and other people being like, hey, I would love to talk with you because you have this type of story and I just want to put it out there. Let's do that. And the more you're doing that, Kate, like the more you're getting ingrained in it, the more it gets like, and those of us are, we're watching and it's something that someone else can look at and be like, okay, if she did that and she took that chance, why can't I? And I think we sometimes, because of social media, that, you know, a lot of times it always gets positioned as we have to have a massive, you know, following already. We have to have all the ring lights set up and everything. We have to have (laughs) all the press release and everything. And like I said, if you saw my first prototype, (laughs) it looks like a black skeleton. (laughs) You can go on my Instagram page for Karaja. Look on the first images. Um, and for her to get to this, like to get mm-hmm. to this today, yeah, uh, it's and there's still more dolls and more things to come. And so, I, I say take it each step at a time. I think we have. To, I think sometimes we think that we got to accomplish all of it in one year, one month, mm-hmm. one day. And I think sometimes society position things that like if you're not making this many followers mm-hmm. or this much money or this many things in this short a time frame, then you're not doing it right. And that's such a false, misleading conception. Yes. Yes. Um, and it's just like some of the best things take time to truly manifest, work on it each day, reveal to people, give people. But like, I think that um, putting it out there first and yes. I, 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 I'm a very big proponent of that. Uh, thank you for this. I mean, I was going to ask you, like, what advice you have for the audience, but you pretty much cover it, <laughs> cover it. And, um, you know, the theme here is just taking action. Yes. It may not be perfect, but you give it a shot, right? What is it? What's the saying? If you, you miss a hundred percent of the shots that you do not make. Yes. Or you don't take or something. Or yeah. take or whatever. Yeah. yeah. Miss hundred percent of the shots that you don't take. Don't take. That's what I meant. Yes. So, <laughs> <no>. <laughs> right. Or I'm always like closed mouths. Don't get fed. Closed mouths. Don't get fed. I, like I don't know that. if that's an African proverb. I feel like that's something my father says, but I'm sure it's, it's actually someone who, who actually said that statement. But wow, I'm gonna, I love I'm gonna that. It was an African proverb. But like, closed mouths don't get. I say that at work too when I'm talking to myself or even my coworkers, and I'm just like, closed mouths don't get fed hmm. until you say it or say something about it. No one's gonna know. We all can't read minds. No, so if they can. I give you credit for that. I'm not an X Men. I wish I could be, but yeah. like, if that was my superpower, but, um, I will say ultimately that like, um, yeah, to your point, you missed 100% of the shots that you don't take. And it doesn't mean that like, you have to like go in the middle of an arena and announce to the world what you're doing, but like you turned on that camera 
you mm -hmm. wrote that blog, you made that post, you did that pitch, you shared it with somebody else, you called up a supplier, you got the material, yep. you, you know, made that note, you made an account, you turned into an LLC, you did these yes. things, like all those things are just yes. as important in this. Yes. Uh, thank you for that inspirational encouragement. <laughs> just way to keep it real, Flora. And way yeah. to, yes, <laughs> preach, queen, preach, 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 preach. <laughs> so um, I want to now transition to, uh, real quick, we'll talk about your future goals for yeah. Courage Dolls. And then I have some fun things up my sleeves. So <laughs> can you tell us, and give us a sneak preview of what your dreams and goals are in the next year or so in the future. Yeah, yeah. So I think, you know, one of the things I was kind of just highlighting was that, you know, we are working on creating more clothing um, and coming out with new accessories for Aaliyah. So that is something that has been a very, very big um, goal and plan of the business. Like um, what's so interesting is that last year I had won a pitch competition um, that was raising funds to be able to finally get this new assortment made. I found this amazing black female designer. And so one thing about me as well, mm -hmm. my business is that a lot of the people that I work with from the suppliers to the marketers, to the designers, to people that are, are women, mm -hmm. majority of them are all women or women of color. Like that is yes. something that I really wanted. I was just like a woman could, I can find a woman who can do that. Yeah. I, I'm always like, and people want to be like, well, it's a discriminating against men. I'm like, no, it's not. For me, my focus and is very much about putting other women on as well. Mm -hmm. And I think that there's so much in um if that inspires in younger girls to see that, like if older women are working together, kind of thing, that then that encourages them to do the same. And so um I just say all that to say that I was planning last year coming out with a new clothing assortment. It didn't necessarily happen in time just because of COVID and production things yeah. that shut down. I ended yeah. up launching an always on fundraiser called mm -hmm. um, Cultivate Courage, which is part of the brand. So, a culture, so when you said your thing is called culture, I'm like cultivate is such a strong word. It is. And, um, it's focused on, you know, a, a t-shirt collection that I launched designed by a black female, the design and um, it's t-shirts, mugs, things of that nature and all the proceeds 100% go towards organizations addressing systemic issues impacting black communities such as food insecurity, mm -hmm. racial injustice. But this year, as that has, you know, um, uh, spawned and grown into its own thing, um, this year, kind of the core things I've really been focusing on outside of the accessories is building further brand awareness for Karajas. Mm -hmm. I realized that, you know, I was sharing with this you before, but I was like, I don't know if I've always told my story as mm -hmm. much um, the way that like I could be, because I'm very much the type of person and some people who know me may be surprised by this. Like, I'm an extrovert, but I'm an introvert. I'm an extroverted introvert Got it. where I'm very much like I, you know, can be in settings and talk with people, but like my home is like my respite and where I just like, you know, go into my space. And so when I have to either figure out, okay, now I'm going to turn on Instagram and do a story. Like it's hard for me to do that. It's hard because I'm just, I wanted to do Courage Dolls honestly behind the scenes. With me, I'm just like, people don't need to know who I am. I just want them to know the product and how amazing things are. But I realize that that's not that's not what it, it needs to be. That what it needs to be is how am I, as the person connected to this, um, really helping navigate and tell that story. And what is the importance of the why of this um, business? Not even just the product, but the why. And so for me this year, building that brand awareness is important. Content creation is yeah. something as well. When you know I had the opportunity to interview our current customer base and also those who weren't customers, just like what is it that you would like to see. Mm -hmm. further with garage dolls and it was a lot about like hey how can we you know expand more you know content and you know about who Aaliyah is her friends and family like um how do we think about like ways that kids can learn with their parents on certain things so one of the things that I've been really keeping in mind especially you know last year if you think about what the past year has been it's kind of these three areas of like we got a pandemic yep. we live in a post-Trump world but mm -hmm. still Trump world and then George Floyd. Yeah. And very three extremely pivotal mm -hmm. things that have happened. Um, 
in our lifetime that a lot of kids have been wondering what to think about, what to say. There's a lot of worry or uncertainty. And a lot of parents, especially for white families who are trying to encourage, you know, their kids to be exposed more to diversity and diverse toys and play and just building empathy. The parents themselves are even trying to. I've had, you know, lately a number of people who buy my doll be white moms. Mm-hmm. And, you know, or what or, you know, non you know, black males as well, who are trying to also support their kids with this. But for us, I think there's a lot of opportunity to have conversations, meaningful conversations about race. Yeah. And how to um, how can our brand help serve in that opportunity as well, where parents are trying to navigate that mm-hmm. themselves. And maybe they have struggled in the past to do that, but they want their child to be exposed to dolls and toys and things that encourage play while they're also trying to navigate. How do I have? meaningful, connected conversations with my child about what's going on in the world and why it is important for representation to matter. And so I think for me, thinking about really meaningful content and helpful content that can allow for conversations and meaningful connections between parents and kids or aunts and kids and nephews, nieces and nephews, or the, you know, allies or educators. And then lastly, um, just doing more partnerships. I think for me this year, I'm very much leaning into partnering more with like women and women of color, whether it be in brand partnerships, whether it be in collaborations, whether it be in just platform partnerships. Um, Those are kind of the key areas in terms of the goal as I go further into this year, into next year, as the goal next year is to kind of really work on coming out with like the next doll in a book, but this year really focusing further on going deeper. Yes. Well, we celebrate your successes and just, we manifest all the things that you said, Flora. Um, thank you for sharing your vision and your goals with us. And we're just excited to grow um, alongside Karaj Dolls and Aaliyah and possibly her future friends in the near future. Um, and so I'm stoked for you and stoked for the future of Karaj. Now, it's the time um, for me to ask you fun questions and then we will close. So here's a speed round um, list of questions. Just a few. Are you ready? I'm ready. Bring it on. All right, Queen. Favorite okay. book? Favorite book? I would have to say I just finished. No, nope, that's this is not the favorite book. The favorite book would have to be Toni Morrison's The Blue Side. No matter what I do, that's always my favorite book. We stand. We stand. Uh, favorite favorite color? Red. Love, yes, the fierceness in the red. By the way, happy belated Lunar New Year. And yes, happy belated Lunar New Year. Yes, yes, the year yes. of the ox, I believe. Year of the ox, yes. yes. Not, not my to- not my zodiac, but we stand ox oxen. Hey, ox, hey. You know? <laughs> the ox is out there. Keep repping, keeping yes. keep 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 you. Keeping you, that's right. Favorite food? I love Chinese food. Like when I was in China, like honestly, I honestly earlier today I was just at a Asian grocery store and then just like buying, um, just like buying milk tea, buying oh. uh, noodles, like different packs of noodles, yes. buying like uh, different type of dumplings and stuff. And so like I was like, Mom, can we go to this place here? Because I love <laughs> getting. I think Asian markets have a lot of good, really good produce and this is cool. Um, and so, but ultimately specifically Chinese food though, I genuinely love, love, love love that, um, favorite nineties or early two thousands icon. Uh, well, I guess, you know, Aaliyah, (laughs) by the way, you're the second person The uh, I interviewed Cassandra Rubino earlier. Um, and she also said Aaliyah is her favorite artist. So there's a theme here, y'all. We are, we are, we have a bias um, and, and a slant and we, we support Aaliyah. <laughs> I can write a four page letter about why I love Aaliyah. Ooh. Some people forget that. <laughs> I would read it. <laughs> For those right. who know what I just meant, they get it. <laughs> oh my God. All right. So last question, and this is a stumper. And, um, and again, I asked this question earlier, but I don't think you listened to the other interview, which is fine. So it's a fair question because you've not had opportunity to listen to this question. Okay. And again, shout out to my colleague, Molly, who came up with this question, or she might've gotten it from somewhere, but I'm giving credit to Molly. And okay. that is, if you are a piece of Lego stuck in a blender, how would you get yourself out? Whoa, Molly. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> that was not what I thought you were going <laughs> to well, 
um, if I was a Lego. Uh, no rules I, are, like, there are no rules. You create your own Okay, world. so if I'm the Batman Lego. Oh, um, my fiance then, would love that, by the way. He <laughs> has his Batman. I will choose to be the Batman Lego. Okay. And I will be able to take, you know, his bat, like, uh, you know, string oh, thing and just, yes. like, latch on to the top of, like, I don't know, maybe um, a blender, maybe the inside. Maybe I tie the um, uh, the blade at the bottom and then lat- throw on the hook, the Batman hook on the outside, tie mm-hmm. it, and then just climb up. Innovation, problem solving, <laughs> creativity is what we're seeing right now, ladies and gentlemen and others. Um, thank you so, so much for participating in that. And um, thank you again for, for participating in this interview. So for our audience, you will have an opportunity to win the Aaliyah bundle. Yeah. Talk about the Aaliyah bundle for us. I'll, I'll yes. put it on camera as well for those. Thank you, Kate. Watching. So as part of just this amazing, you know, and also just, you know, the inauguration, I guess it's the second, you know, podcast episode that Kate's doing. But to celebrate that, we, you know, have agreed to do a giveaway of Aaliyah Bundle, which includes the lovely doll, Aaliyah, the book, Don't Give Up, Aaliyah, and the awesome positive affirming pin because representation matters. That's that you right. You can rock on your backpack. You could rock on your blazer. You could rock on your jean jacket, your hat everywhere you want it to show proudly why representation matters. And so this is something that we're going to plan to do a giveaway on Monday, which is also Black Girl Magic Day. Yes, um, and that right? is Monday, February 15th, 15th, 2021. Yes, so please be looking out for the information on the rules on that. Um, watching on Monday, having the opportunity to follow our Courage Dolls Instagram page in addition to Cultivate with Kate's um, mm-hmm. Instagram page too. And so this is just another opportunity and avenue to just support um, women and women of color as we are just going out there and doing things. And so um, please look on the lookout um, and follow definitely our pages. But on Monday, we'll be sharing more of the criteria and the opportunity for you to win your very own Aaliyah bundle just in time for the rest of Black History Month. Also getting ready for Women's History Month as well. That's right, Mark. Keep stepping in support of women. Yes, keep on, keep stepping on. That's right, that's right. Again, Flora Ekpe Ideng, people. Kate Siriyate. Thank you, thank you. (laughs) Well, audience, thank you. Thank you, family, for listening in on uh, Cultivating with Kate, um, Cultivating Conversations. Once again, we thank Flora for her conversations and sharing her story and for Aaliyah in making her appearance. And um, have a wonderful, wonderful, phenomenal day. Bye, everybody. Thank you all.